Hello and welcome to the um, North Alabama School for Organizers uh, Fireside Chats. Uh, the, uh, the North Alabama School for Organizing I, Organizers uh, vision uh, is, is to hopefully um, create, create a learning and educational environment. Uh, to educate, to organize, and a school where people can attend to enhance and ex expand the meaningful areas of organizing. We hope to help people to empower their communities and um, to help these communities become self-determined and to help solve problems in their community. Uh, and today we have some real special guests here from our Huntsville community that have been around for quite a while. Uh, representatives of the industrial uh, workers of the world and uh, the IWW, which has been around for a long time. Uh, we have Jacob uh, Morrison, who is the secretary, and David Story, who is with it, with the uh, the union and is a longtime organizer, and uh, we're so glad to have them here. Welcome, guys. And uh, I'm wondering if we could just start off here by, you know, one of you just explaining to us uh, what you've done organizing or just something about yourself, you know, so we can get to know, you know, we can get to know you a little bit better here. And although uh, I'm also a member of the union. Okay, who's going to, David? So yeah, it kind of sounded like I was going to start start off. So <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is David Story. I think I know most everybody here, uh, but you know, if this is recorded, I probably won't know everyone. Uh, I've been a union member uh, since I was uh, 16. I uh, grew up in a union household, uh, extremely democratic, uh, leaning household. My, you know, my, my, my grandparents were Democrats. My parents were Democrats. Uh, and, and of course I grew up in, in kind of that same, uh, same, uh, political leaning, uh, as a young kid. Um, my, my father was a steel work. He was actually a paper worker. He was a, uh, steel workers took them over years later, but, uh, um, so yeah, we, I've, I've, it's been one of those things where I was always taught, you know, to work union because of the solidarity there, because of, uh, the ability, you know, to, uh, to work together, to improve people's lives, uh, the equality that comes with being in a union not just uh, you know race equality that we're seeing uh, in in the nation today but also uh you know feminist feminism equality you know because uh the uh a female in my plant makes the same amount of money that does the same job that a male makes and i and and i think that's important so uh yeah as uh as i grew up i kind of as as most kids do, I I pushed away from what my parents wanted and leaned more towards a libertarian uh, mindset in my early twenties, and kind of got under the guise of if I work hard and uh, do all the right things, that I'll be more successful than everybody else. And you know, and I think at that age, that's an easy uh, easy uh, mantra to fall into. Uh, because everybody in their early twenties thinks they can they can rule the world at some point, and then uh, as I traveled, I, I got into a job with UAW, uh, traveling to Europe and different places, Mexico, Canada, and I kind of seen a whole different light, you know, as far as the way the rest of the world worked as opposed to the way the United States works, especially whenever I was in Germany. 
and seeing a lot of the social systems that was set up over there to help people. Uh, the labor councils that not just, uh, you know, like we have labor unions here, and we kind of fight against the company for the betterment of the workers. And over there, they've got really a revolutionary tactic to where their labor councils are actually on the CEO, on the boards of the companies. And it's a 50-50 match. So they have quite a bit more leverage than we do in the United States. And seeing that <laughs> and coupled with the amount of vacation that they have and a very, I mean, just an amazing uh, amount of recreation that they have that Americans really don't, don't have. Uh, it, it changed my entire outlook from back from the libertarian to where I was kind of looking for something more uh, as more of a social anarchist is what I call myself nowadays to where, you know, I, I believe that uh, we should be supporting the community in all the ways possible, but we should be as free as possible. Uh, so uh, that's kind of got me to where I started looking with uh, the IWW because I've now I've been a machinist union member for probably uh, 15, 16 years, I guess. And I'm the president of the local here in Decatur. Uh, but then it, the business unions was, they're very good for people. Uh, you know, there is, there's nothing wrong with a business union and, and I make more money now than, than I've ever made. Uh, and more than most people in the same field that I work. But it, they they don't they don't have the same liberty that that a lot of the IWW uh, really preached, and so I started looking for something different and uh, joined the IWW, and that's kind of somewhere along the same lines. I was doing a lot of the I'm, I'm a secretary treasurer with the state council, which is the legislative. Uh, arm of the machinist union that that kind of endorses candidates at the state level and also uh, I go to DC and Montgomery to lobby on behalf of all of our union members of the state uh, but that was kind of at the point where uh, Jacob me and Jacob teamed up and Jacob was very politically active and I've never uh, throughout my entire uh, life been very politically active up until my mid to late 40s. I mean, I voted, uh, you know, every year, but that was that was pretty much the extent of it until I got elected to the state council. And then it kind of forced my hand to be more politically active. Uh, and so me and Jacob kind of teamed up and he was an IWW. Well, I don't, I think originally maybe he wasn't, I, I don't think he had heard a lot about the IWW and I'll let Jacob tell that story, but uh, I don't know that he was originally a member. Uh, but we, we started discussing the possibilities because IWW uh, being more of a radical union and very low dues as opposed to a lot of your business unions. Um, they have the ability to get out and organize groups of individuals that may not be able to afford to be in your traditional business union. In other words, uh, your traditional business unions will be made up of electricians, factory workers, mechanics, and things like that are generally, you know, upper middle class, middle class, upper middle class wages. And IWW, looks at it as a from a different perspective of they want everybody to be able to afford to be in a union and so their due structures are progressive even to the point to where uh you know we've got members in prisons that don't pay dues and they're, they're still members and they're organizing in the prisons uh with i walk and with the hopes that you know, not only they make demands for better living conditions in the prisons, but when they get out, 
they have that uh, that concept of solidarity and a, a brotherhood or sisterhood or that fraternal uh, mindset that they work together to make changes wherever they're at. So we came together and uh, had this radical idea that maybe we could form a, a, a IWW branch in Huntsville and it's really kicked off. Uh, I don't know what the membership is now. I think it's close to 40 members and we're looking at, uh, you know, it's a very broad, uh, broad swath of society. Uh, we've got some people from the Huntsville Public Works Department and we've actually got people from UAH Education Department that's interested. So, you know, and I think that speaks to what the IWW does in general is it pits all workers together against the capitalist society in general. So, you know, I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and then they, they kind of, because the dues are so low, they, they really lean on people that are more educated in organizing that may have some more years in unionism and, uh, you know, as opposed to paying uh, what, you know, your business unions will do as far as paying salaries to, uh, to hired help, you know, the easiest term for it, they, they, it's all voluntary work. So uh, I think it's a wonderful thing and we'll keep pushing forward, but you know, the whole thing is uh, trying to get everybody involved in the uh working class movement because you know, i'm 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 truly of the opinion uh i don't know who made the quote but at some point in history somebody said that unions have done more for for you know the working class and than, than anything else in history and i truly believe that and that's the only way we're ever going to get to the point to where we have health care and we have you know some leisure time and we're able to do the things that we should be able to do without constantly having to work to make somebody else profits. Yeah. All right. Uh, I just have a question. Do you, is the IWW socialist? Union the IWW or? is apolitical. So they do not align with any political organization whatsoever. Uh, some have said that they're social anarchists, uh, but, I, you know, to me, that kind of pushes the, pushes the envelope of what our Constitution says is that we don't care about politics, that the, that the power that we derive from is all workers in general. So, uh, I don't know that there's an end game to the IWW as far as socialism, communism, uh, you know, whatever, whatever ism you want to call it. Uh, I, I think their main goal is to organize workers, all workers in all aspects of life and demand uh, a fair wage. I, I know one of the, one of the opening lines is uh, workers, uh, does I can't remember the exact. The working class and the employing class have nothing in common. Yeah, but what is the other one with uh, the workers deserve everything that they, the tolls of their labor, basically. Labor I mean, creates all wealth and, and uh, labor's entitled to all wealth, maybe. Yeah, exactly. So, so, something like that. But yeah, that's, that's socialist. You can call it socialism, but their beliefs is if you work, if you work it, you should own it. So, yeah, the the Constitution is pretty clear that that we're that we don't affiliate with any particular ideology or party or political organization. But the Constitution is also pretty clear that the IWW is an anti-capitalist union. Um, and so that doesn't mean that members of the IWW have to be anti-capitalist. Um, doesn't mean that at all, but that's the union's official stance. Okay. Mark Marxism, you know, I mean, um, that sounds like, sounds like 
it sounds like some Marxism in there too, but you know, it could be just the nature of the history of unions too. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Marx is all, um, Marx is intertwined with most anti-capitalist uh, ideologies to some extent or another, but, um, but you know, the, it, the IWW is, is not officially, you know, associated with any particular anti-capitalist strain of thought, um, mm -hmm. just kind of a, a broad tent, so to speak, as far, or, or an undefined tent. <laughs> Yeah. Anti-capitalist, but undefined beyond that. And you don't have to be an anti-capitalist to be an IWW. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jacob, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, if you can, briefly? Yeah, yeah. Like, like David said, when when we met, <coughs> I was extremely politically active. Um, I spent two years, maybe, um, maybe the better part of three. Uh, really involved with the Democratic Party here. I was um, in leadership of the Alabama College Democrats. I ran for the state committee, and um, I knocked on, in 2018, I knocked on like a thousand doors, made like a thousand phone calls uh, for Democrats up here. And, um, and I did that because I wanted to help make people's lives better. And um, I, I felt like electing Democrats would be one way to do that. And um, I'm not saying that I disagree with that anymore, but uh, in 2018 in Alabama, uh, Democrats lost 72 seats across the state. And so I sat there after the election results and I was like, man, I put in a whole lot of work and literally like not a single person's life is better. You know, like there's not, no, nobody's life is made better by, by the work that I put in. Nobody's life was made better by the work that anybody put in across the state. And that's pretty lame, um, <laughs> to put it uh, to put it bluntly. I was not happy with that, and so I started looking for other ways that I could help people because I was never particularly attached to the Democratic Party. I grew up conservative um, culturally, and and basic. I would have aligned myself more with the Republican Party growing up before I really defined my political leanings. So. I was only attached to the Democratic Party in so far as I saw it as a vehicle for positive change for the working class. And so I felt uh, in Alabama, maybe that uh, my time and resources could be better spent doing something else. So I started trying to read. Um, I started trying to research and started reading about the labor movement and what it's done for people how the labor movement was instrumental, not only in winning workers better wages and benefits on the job through contracts, but also in pushing elected officials to enact laws that are better for work, the working class, ending child labor laws, eight hour workday, the weekend, um, national holidays, all of these things were put into place by an organized and oftentimes militant labor movement. And so I uh, realized that I had a union on my job. I joined my union, um, which is the American Federation of Government Employees. I'm a federal employee. I work uh, for the Corps of Engineers. And, um, and so I joined my union. But like I said, I wanted to help people. And specifically, I wanted to help like the least of these. I worked in the restaurant industry for three years. Um, and I saw, and, and most of that time I was living at home and during the time that I was living at home, working at this restaurant, I was oftentimes the only person in the whole restaurant that didn't have bills to pay. Every single other person in this little, you know, podunk burger joint had to pay rent. They had to put food on their table. They had to make sure their kids could eat. They had insurance. They had to pay gas. They, I mean, you know. They were adults and they had to live and they were live and they had to live on what I was going to work for spending money. Right. And that was, you know, and so that really um, radicalized me is, 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 yeah. is the term that a lot of people say, because I didn't do anything to grow up 
in a house that I, I didn't have to contribute to the income when I got old enough to work. I didn't, I didn't, you know, and that wasn't by any of my doings. My parents, well, I was fortunate enough to live in a house where my parents both had steady incomes and, and I didn't have to work. And so the work that I did while I was living at home was extracurricular. It was something that I chose to do, but this wasn't the case for all these other people. And so I not only wanted to help people that I work with at the Corps of Engineers in my you know, nice middle-class job, I wanted to help people like that. And I can't go and organize people in restaurants with the American Federation of Government Employees, right? They're not government employees. And so about that time, when I'm looking for ways to help outside of my union, like David mentioned, um, he said something about being in the IWW. And, and like you mentioned, I had, I had read about it, but I didn't know it was still alive, so to speak. And when I realized that it was still around, I joined and David and I and some other people in Huntsville started talking about uh, forming a branch. And so we did, we were chartered in August of 2019. Um, we started with, you know, just David and I having a cup of coffee, um, kicking the idea around. And now we've got, like he said, we've got more than 30 members and um, we have a few kind of, uh, we have a few campaigns that are in the early stages and uh, we have a couple of leads that we're working on. And, and so that's exciting <clears throat> because anybody in Huntsville in Alabama, in the country, can come to this union and say, I want to organize my workplace, and you can do it. And what's and and what what I really like about unions in the labor movement is how empowering it is. Because when I was really active in like electoral politics, one thing that I one thing that I felt deeply is how unempowering it is. No matter how good the candidate is, right? I love Bernie Sanders. I was a very big advocate of Bernie Sanders' presidential campaigns. And, but, but still, when I would go and knock on doors, what I was doing is saying, sir or ma'am, in six months, I am requesting that you pull, this le pull, pull the lever for this man that you have never met, that I have never met, and hope that he wins and hope that if he wins, he won't betray you like every other politician has in your life, right? That's just fundamentally unempowering. But when you're talking to them about organizing your workplace, you're not telling them to wait on, a, wait on an election. You're not telling them to put your trust in this person that they've never met. You're telling them that they can start working to make their lives better right now. And all they have to do is put their trust in themselves and their fellow workers. And that's empowering, I think. Yeah. And I'm inspired by that greatly. So, um, so, so that's my story. That's why I'm involved in the labor movement. That's why I'm in the IWW and that's why I, I believe that. All right, well, that's great. I, uh, I also have some experience with unions. Uh, I was a union steward at the, uh, for at the Montgomery Ward which I don't know if many people remember Montgomery Ward, which was a, you know, a department store. And during the period of time when I was kind of running around, uh, you might say underground or in hiding or whatever, <clears throat> I had taken on different names. And I got a job at, at Montgomery Ward as a uh, selling tires, basically. And, uh, but, but it was, the, the company was so bad that any time you, and this was commission, and any, uh, any time a tire or a product would become a good seller, they would cut the commission. Uh, and they were doing that over in the auto center as far as the mechanics. And, uh, and we were even getting, when I got my uh, commission, papers, uh, it would show that at one point I had tires returned in, in ladies' lingerie. And it's like, this is obvious, we're getting ripped off. Uh, and so were the mechanics, so we organized, we organized a union. And, but about a week into it, we were locked out. 
Uh, they brought in scabs, you know, to do our jobs. Uh, they brought in, you know, some pretty heavy hitters there. So we had to go and, and pick it, the store. And we did, we, we did it for about two months and cost them a lot of money. Uh, but they did bring, they finally brought us back in, you know, kicked out the scabs that they promised them everything. And then um, <clears throat> gave us our job back. But one of the things that they did was every time they would hire someone, they would make sure that that person was anti-union. And so eventually as a turnover in retail, they were able to eventually get rid of that union, you know? So they have a number of different tactics for doing that. Uh, <clears throat> but the other thing I wanna know is, um, you know, I've done a lot of study on on the um, uh, Haymarket Square riots, and uh, from what I'm seeing is that uh, that particular point in time uh, had a lot of influence on on the organizing the IWW, and uh, it seems to me that it has a lot of the same uh, you know the same guidelines, but. What is the most, what would you say is the most pressing, important issue right now in terms of trying to organize unions? Yeah, that's, uh, well, that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, so that's a million dollar question. You know, I mean, at, at a time when <clears throat> over the past, and I mean, y'all are old enough to know, I'm old enough to know, I've watched uh, depressed wages for the past 40 years. Um, you know, I at a time when wages have been stagnant since basically uh, the era right before Reagan, um, and when you compare them to, to the the rise in, uh, in uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Productivity. Well, not so much productivity, not income, not, uh, GDP. Uh, the rise in the cost of living mm -hmm. coupled with the rise in wages have basically stayed the same. And in, in some cases have actually the wages have went down with the rise in the cost of living since since pre pre Reagan, and you look at that, if you overlay that with a chart of union density, and when I say union density, the amount of union members in the United States, there is a direct correlation with the decline. I mean, it's almost identical the decline in union density and the decline in real wages that people bring home. <clears throat> the yeah. problem is that the, the government in general, and unfortunately not just the Republican government, but the Democrats as well, have done nothing to help us uh, bolster up unions. You know, even under eight years of uh, President Obama, we've seen absolutely zero help from him under Clinton. We've seen NAFTA enacted. Uh, it's, it's, it, has, it has been a demise in American factory work. Uh, but basically since Reagan <coughs> fired all of the air traffic controllers and you know, at that point he, he, he opened it up and said, look, if, if you want to violate federal law, you're more than more than willing to, and we're not going to prosecute the companies for doing it. Uh, so in my opinion, I mean, everything relates back to what we're doing now. When you ask what is the biggest, you know, issue with the, with uh, getting getting in the in the labor movement, and it's making people realize that they've got the power, but most people are rightfully scared. Most of the people that I organize are deathly afraid 
of the plant closing, if they unionize because they feel like if we ask for more money, if we ask for more benefits, better health care, anything that teeters the uh, the leverage into their favor, that the company's just going to close up and move to Mexico, South America, uh, Eastern Europe, and, and it's happened time and time again. Uh, so you know, justifiably, they, they're, they're worried. The, the, the biggest thing that, you know, that I try to preach to people is there's a big movement right now and, and bringing back American manufacturing and, and that's kind of on the rise. So, you know, we need to ride that wave as much as possible. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's hard to argue with them. It is hard to argue with them, and the governments, you know, even under Trump, Trump talked about make America great again and bringing all, all the st steel was a big thing that he talked about early on. He hasn't done shit. I mean, tr uh, and, there, uh, and that kind of speaks to what we were talking about as far as political uh, alliances, is, uh, you know, throughout my throughout my entire lifetime, there's not been. Uh, a Democrat or Republican help us, period. Uh, so, you know, unless the American workers start taking the power back, you, you, they're definitely not going to be able to rely on any politicians to help them. Do you think that, um, you know, now that this pandemic has hit and, you know, the essential worker has become important uh, and people are beginning to look at the the essential worker as uh, <clears throat> as being important, whereas otherwise, you know, they looked at just the lower level uh, citizenry. Uh, do you think that that is going to help uh, give a boost to the unions? Uh, if if they'll organize, yeah, you know, I'm organizing healthcare workers right now, some nurses over in Gadsden. And the hospital has gotten millions of dollars in additional funding, and they laid off uh, workers and cut their hours, you know, as far as the nurses go. So it's, it, it, yeah, if they will, it, that's the biggest thing is to convince folks the only way you're going to make any gains is to stand together as a group. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, but it all goes back to what I, you know, what I initially said is that fear. You, we, for somehow we've got to get people over. And of all people, the nurses should be the least fearful of any class of work of workers there is out there because, oh, you know, you can shut down a factory and move it to Mexico. It's expensive, but you can do it. But you're not going to shut down a hospital and move it to Mexico. So, but they're still just in deathly fear that they're going to close these. And, and unfortunately, I think we've seen 11, 13 hospitals in Alabama close in the last eight or nine years. So they are closing some, but, uh, you know, those, those nurses are being shifted to other hospitals because it's not like the amount of people that are getting sick are being reduced. Yeah. And they're not going to go to Tennessee or Georgia to do it, you know, so. Yeah. Right. You know, it takes, it's going to take um, action and invigoration on the part of the unions, like David said, but it, it's going to take, um, you know, belief in their own power from the workers. You know, I can, like, somebody talked to me, there was a, there was a plant where somebody had died, and this person that worked there, his girlfriend reached out to us and was like wanting him to organize and I was like well I'll talk to him anytime but she said that he was scared because he might lose his job and it's like someone just died you know like losing your job isn't you know that's not like the ultimate thing here that you should be worrying about but people are still worrying about it you know so like it, it, it it's going to take action on the part of the unions for sure and um, you know I can talk um, all day about lackluster unions and, and unions 
members that are just not interested in expanding beyond their current membership or doing anything more broad in the community. I think that's very important. I think the longshoremen, uh, ILWU, they took a, they did a, a nine minute work stoppage in um, in protest and the uh, uh, to support Black Lives Matter. And I think that's very important. And I think that we need more social justice uh, minded unions, but we also need the workers to believe in themselves and believe in the union, which is believing in themselves because the union is just the workers. Um, and, you know, like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Like I can go and I can talk to workers all day, but if they don't believe in themselves, if they don't, um, kind of, if they don't shake off the kind of prevailing um, capitalist ideology that you, you know, keep your head down and do what your boss says, and you know, if they if they say jump, you say how high. You know, they need to shake that off, and uh, they need to realize that they've got a right to demand why they're being told to jump and see if it's in the job description. And they have a right to write the job description, and they have a right to negotiate fair wages for that job. And you know, like, so unions need to unions need to do more, and people need to believe in themselves. Yeah, to to piggyback off what he's saying, how we've got a saying uh, in our organizing class with the machinists, and it's that unions don't organize workers; workers organize workers. So, you know, we, even though we consider ourselves organizers, we're, we're mainly providers of information. We're the conduit to get those people to where they want to be. But if there's no action on the part of the people, one organizer or a dozen organizers or a hundred organizers are not going to be able to bring that group to where they want to be unless they want to do it themselves. Yeah, and I guess this might be a, just a pipe dream for me. I don't know. But, you know, when I think about the uh, migrant workers, um, the field workers, uh, those people, you know, who, who may not be, you know, they may come in and work for a season and then go somewhere else. Uh, but if there was some way, you know, to get, to get the migrant workers involved in, in the local union where they're at. And I'm sure if they go back somewhere where there's another, you know, IWW union, that they could work through that union too. Um, I mean, I'm talking about a flow, but if not the IWW, why not having them involved in, you know, um, United Farm Workers Union or something like that, like, you know, Cesar Chavez did back in the day, you know, and working with them because I see, I, you know, I see, I see these people as, as being uh, stereotyped, you know, because first of all, they're not treated as a very respectful person in society and, uh, and the whole capitalist system has been, you know, designed to crush unions. But if there's some way that we you could bring those people in also, uh, I think that I'm not saying you, I'm saying we, because it's, a, it's, a, it's everybody's job. But I guess I'm looking at the, 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 the people who considered to be the lowest, but those are the people that have the most to say, you know, and those are the people that can do the most organizing. And, yeah. and so I don't see that happening. I wish it was, but I don't see that happening. And I wish there was some way a union could do something like that. Well, well actually, the, go ahead, Jacob. Um, <clears throat> migrant, you know, one of the reason that migrant workers don't are fearful of organizing is, is because they are um, they're put in this intentionally precarious situation where they are allowed to cross, some number of them are allowed to cross the border um, without papers. And because the um, entrenched capitalist interests want this cheap exploitable labor, uh, and theoretically, 
they have the right to organize. Theoretically, um, it is illegal for their employers to there retaliate against them. But in reality, what happens is um, a, uh, a plant can haul ice into a workplace raid. That happened in Mississippi uh, just a few months ago. Um, the ice came and raided a uh, raided a coke plant, uh, a chicken processing plant. Not the Coke brothers. I learned later a uh, different set of cokes, um, but but a coke like chicken processing plant and um, a, uh, arrested hundreds of worker, hundreds of undocumented immigrants, and deported uh, dozens and dozens of them. And this was in a unionized plant. This was an and. and the prevailing wisdom is that this was done in retaliation against a sexual harassment lawsuit that the workers won that was settled for like $2.6 million or something like that. Um, and so after that, to avoid paying some of that out, they uh, had some of their workers deported. And this was in a union plant. And after that happened, the Mississippi Department of Labor shared the, their um, job, job fair for them. I mean, that, you know, <clears throat> in, in many ways, we're living in a, in a, a fascist country because that, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a fascism, you know, like the state coming in and violently repressing worker organizing and then serving as advertisers for the same uh, private interests when they need to replace these workers that they have violently expelled from the country. You know, that, yeah. that's what fascism is, is the state being used to enrich private interests. Yeah, so, and, and, and what, of, what about the ones that have green cards, for instance? Is there, it, is it yeah, a you know, it's obviously it's, it, you can't deport them, but they're in a more, uh, or, you know, I don't, green cards, I'm not sure, but there are a lot of people that are here on visas that are here that they're attached to their jobs. And so uh -huh. if their employer fires them, then they no longer have reason to be in the country and they can be deported at that point. Oh, okay. I, I wasn't aware of that. Oh. Green cards, I think, are a little bit different. I don't know, David, may have yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So one of the first, the first organizing course I ever went to with my union, uh, when we, we, they flew us into Maryland and it's a week long course. Uh, on a Sunday we came in and the video that we watched was, and I can't remember the name of it, but I guarantee you it's on YouTube. And actually I recorded the entire video, uh, in the studio and streamed it live to Facebook. So you can watch it on my Facebook page, but the entire, it was a one hour show on the coalition of Immokalee workers in Southwest Florida. And it was, it was migrant workers under the uh, readings of Chavez, which you mentioned earlier, organizing in uh, the fields and basically what they were doing, the companies that they were working for was playing both sides of the ropes and they couldn't pay them this because the companies that they were selling to was demanding tomatoes and different things at this price. They organized together. Uh, and, I, and this has been, man, this has been years ago. So I'm, I'm really reaching. If, if it's not exactly right, you'll have to forgive me. But uh, they organized together. And I think the first group they went after was Taco Bell. And they'd done a nationwide <coughs> Uh, petition of Taco Bell say uh, because Taco Bell I think was buying the tomatoes at the time this was around 2000 2001 uh, and, uh, but they they started really hammering Taco Bell to say you have to pay this amount per pound for fruit uh, in order for us to get this and so they made nationwide demands and they won I, I I can't remember the entire amount, but I want to say, like, I mean, these were huge corporations, Taco Bell, Wendy's, Walmart was one of them, and they won all of these demands, but, you know, it was through organizing, and it was all, they were all migrant workers in the fields, uh, hmm. 
down in Southwest Florida. And I believe, and there was, and the, the wonderful thing was it was all worker driven. There was no uh, international or national union supporting them. They had just read about Chavez and what he had accomplished and they made up the deter. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where workers organize workers. But I think they're still in the, uh, they're still making demands and they're still doing good. So, you know, there's there's definitely inroads to be had there if you can get the workers convinced that they have the power to do those things. Okay. Can I interject a question at this point? Sure. Ms. Reggie. Um, Jake, you, you said, I believe you said, and first of all, please don't misconstrue anything I say. I totally support what y'all are trying to do. But you said that uh, employer, employer class has nothing in common with the employee class. I believe that's pretty close to exactly what you said. So my question is, how do self-employed workers fit into this scenario? Sure. So that was, that was uh, from the IWW and um, the self-employed workers are workers who own their own means of production and that's and so uh, you can the IWW does not because you're not an employer you don't employ anybody you employ yourself you don't employ anybody else and so the you can be that you can be a member of the IWW and own your own business as long as you're the only employee, or you can be a member of the IWW and be a collective owner of a uh, cooperative. So okay. Red Emma's in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, is one of the one of the more successful IWW cooperatives. It's a, a coffee house and, and bookstore that is cooperatively owned. Uh, run and, and um, staffed by IWW members. They, they all own part of the company and they all work there and, and they all collectively make decisions and everything. But so they don't, they don't employ anybody, they employ themselves, so. Well, that's, I think that's probably the only way we're gonna solve our problem is to get rid of capitalism, is yeah. to do it by forming cooperatives. Yeah. That's, and that's what I've been, trying to do with absolutely no progress down here in Birmingham, but it's not hopeless. There's still some good people that are interested in it. Uh, but I don't see any other way to undo capitalism and to make it irrelevant by forming cooperative businesses. Um, well, uh, you know, forming cooperative businesses is really, really difficult because the people who would be interested in forming cooperative businesses are likely not the kinds of people who have a bunch of money that they can invest. You know, right. the fact that if you have a lot of money, you're probably not the type of person that's going to start a cooperative business because you want to keep all the profits yourself, right? Um, right. And, and you're up against a lot of a, a, uh, you're up against a lot of competition from a lot of people who have a lot more resources than you. Not to say, like I said, Red Emma's they they are successful and they do really well. Um, but there are unions that have um, <clears throat> that have right of first refusal clauses in their contract, I believe, which say that you know at any point should the uh, should the company decide I'm gonna you know we're gonna go bankrupt or we're gonna sell to somebody else, the workers have the chance then to take out a loan and buy the company themselves. And so that's something where, yeah, yeah, that that's something that I would I would definitely be a proponent of because you allow the the capitalists to kind of build up the institution and, and at the point that they're ready to leave, if you could get a loan to um, to purchase that and take it over, you would have you know, that head start, and that would be a that would be a good way to build uh, working class power, um, fighting for those clauses and contracts more often. I don't think it's I don't think it's a uh, particularly common thing but it's something that that i would i would love to see more of and i would love to see like more public fights about stuff like that well some of the some of the best thinking that i've heard on this subject 
you're, you're absolutely right that trying to form a cooperative business means that you're going to immediately run into the problem of how to get the money to do it. Uh, so it's not a bad idea to think along the lines of starting small, not trying to take the whole thing at one time. Uh, you know, start a small cooperative business that maybe is not your only gig and see what you can grow it into. Uh, I, I think that's the only way the small people are going to be able to get their foot in the door at all. Um, Richard Wolf, a lot of resources about, he's a big uh, advocate of cooperative enterprises. Um, Richard Wolf with two Fs. Okay, that's, I'll look him up. Um, David and I own a cooperative business, actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, we we host a radio show on, on and and so we like buy the airtime from the station and as our show we incorporated our show um, and we own it cooperatively. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. My, my, my biggest dream in the labor movement is for workers to own what they work. And if you go back all the way back to the 1800s and 1900s, everyone or a lot of the, you know, writers, philosophers of the time thought the revolution would bring about that ownership. And I think we're uh, with the militarization of uh, police, we are far past workers being over being able to overthrow the uh, uh, the owners of the companies like they were would have been able to in the 1800s or early 1900s, but I think the union provides an ability to force their hand uh, as far as equalizing equalizing the ownership because if you're making demands and the company has to sit down with you and negotiate, then then effectively you are a partner in that business. Although you may not be reaping all of the profits, you have the ability to demand what profits you can, you can reap. So that's kind of my thoughts on revolutionary unionism. Right. And I think that, I think that the IWW and, and unions like the ILWU, the International Longshoremen and Warehouse Union, um, the unions like that, that, that are self-described revolutionary unions and they're, and they, they um, operate within a frame of class struggle and, and they have a explicit critique of capitalism. I think that's, I think it's it's good and, and it's important because you know if the goal is ultimately worker ownership of the means of production, then unions will at some point be an obsolete um, obsolete institution. And so, uh, business unions, if that's not their goal, then they could eventually become um, opponents of worker ownership of the means of production because they want to preserve their place in the um within the the hierarchy and, and the uh, power structure and so yeah and so it's good to have you know these it, it's good to have these unions like the iww that that are explicitly for worker ownership of the means of production because you know that they, they it's never going to be you know you're never going to have to fight your union and in, insofar as that is concerned uh, but, you know, also I've, um, you know, like David said that he would uh, identify as some sort of an anarchist. I have always kind of um, shied from any particular like anti-cap, uh, uh, describing myself as any particular anti-capitalist ideology because uh, it's, you know, because I've never lived in a world where worker ownership of the means of production is like the default, and I've never lived in a stateless, classless, moneyless society, you know, I, it's really difficult for me to imagine that kind of thing. Um, so, but I do know what we need 
now, and I think what we need now is it, you know, it, it requires a, a form of class struggle and it requires recognizing that that's what you're doing. Um, because we're, you know, we're not like collaborators with the, uh, with like the GM owners or something. They're, they, they see us as their enemies and, uh, you know, we need to be uh, clear eyed about um, about our position in the power structure and, and how to make change. Well, it sounds to me like you've kind of put your finger on the answer to the question I asked earlier about what is the main goal of the union movement right now or the main objective and how are you going to do this? I have no idea, but you're going to have to figure out a way to get enough workers behind you at one time to make a difference because right now it's, you know, anybody that sticks their head up gets picked off. I mean, I've talked to several people here in Birmingham that are absolutely, you know, that are in the, the nursing profession, the medical profession, they're about to tear their hair out because they're getting screwed over so bad. Yeah. And if, but if you even say, if they were even heard to mention the word union, I mean, some of these people are using fake names on Facebook. They're so scared that their employer is going to find out what they're saying. <laughs> and, and, you know, they, I don't know how if they talk about having a shortage of nurses, but apparently they're entirely disposable. If they ever say the word union, they're out on their ass. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. You, know, you, are, you, know, you really hear what I'm saying, right? Yeah. 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 That's, you know, that, that's extremely important. You can't, um, rely on one person to make change. Like you said, if one person sticks their neck out, well, everybody's got to stick their neck out, right? That's the whole point of a strike is, you know, you don't have one person that's really mad and they go walk off the job. No, they'll be fired. That's why everybody goes and walks off the job. You can't, you know, nothing is going to happen when, uh, or very little is going to happen if one person is mad and they're, you know, mouthing off to the boss. It, it takes everybody and that's, and you know, uh, the IWW and Labor Notes and, and other unions, they offer trainings to, um, to, to help workers strategize about, because, it, you know, it, this has been done hundreds and thousands of times over the decades in multiple countries and multiple states. There are people that have um, that have this experience and there are people that can teach you and there are people that have made mistakes and that have learned from their mistakes. And so there's no, you know, there's, there's so many resources, there's so many trainings um, that people can and should take uh, before they, you know, go and start telling everybody that they work with, hey, let's form a union. You know, there are ways to go about doing things. Uh, you don't, what, one of the things that, that, that I've heard in training multiple times is that the first conversation you have with somebody, you don't drop the U-bomb, right? <laughs> you got to be careful you get, because uh, you don't know who you're talking to. Um, you don't know if they're going to go rat you out to the boss and get you fired. Um, so, you know, there, uh, there, are good, there, there are good strategies that have been uh, put in play that, that have been formulated through years and years of practice and education that I would encourage people to look into. Uh, if they're interested in organizing, you know, before they start, before they start telling everybody. Yeah, and it seems like uh, <clears throat> maybe to start explaining a workplace democracy, yeah. you know, would be a good term <clears throat> when we're talking to people, trying to get some kind of democracy into their, you know, into their workplace and yeah, trying well, to, you know, trying to get people thinking about that. In effect, uh, that's all a union is, is yeah. a democratic organization. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all. Anybody else have any questions before we end up here? Um, I want to thank you folks for coming on. You know, of course, you know, I'll bid some of the meetings too. And um, I want to know how, how someone can reach you, you know, if they see this, you know, this, uh, this video here, <clears throat> how can they contact you? Yeah, so the Huntsville IWW is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at HSBIWW. 
and you can email us at organize at hsviww.org. Okay, great. Hey, thanks so much for coming on. Um, you know, we'd love to be able to get some of your training uh, that, that you've had maybe on our show too. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's continue that conversation if we can. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. folks. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank